Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. I wish that we could all be in person, but 2020. Um, so I'm going to start with a, not really a political statement, but maybe a cultural sociological statement that I'm going to guess that basically everyone listening is going to agree with. And that is right now in the United States of America, we have a real problem with division. And by division, I don't just mean disagreement. I don't just mean Republican versus Democrat. I don't just mean secular versus religious. I don't mean the things that normally cause us to disagree, whether it's sports, whether it is um, your favorite television show, that all of that is normal. All of that is sometimes can be really healthy. I mean, we need disagreements. We need sort of the, the iron sharpening iron of, of sharpening each other's thinking and sometimes changing our thinking as we learn new things and we discover things that are true. What I'm talking about is division and disagreement and disunity to the extent that our nation is plagued with very real animosity and very real enmity. In this country right now, Americans are hating each other. Red versus blue, they are hating each other. Now, that doesn't come as a surprise, just anecdotally, you can just see it on the TV screen, whether you're watching the extreme left face off against the extreme right in the streets of America's cities, where you'll have Antifa on one side and the Proud Boys on the other side. Those are the extremes. But even in the mainstream, you see the mainstream right and the mainstream left facing off against each other on cable news, online, shouting, screaming, yelling. Twitter is aflame with fury and rage and anger. It's a crisis. How big of a crisis? The numbers are pretty staggering at this point. Right now, Americans, if you're a Democrat, your regard for Republicans is at an all time low. Uh, if you're a Republican, your regard for Democrats is at an all time low. The percentage of Republicans who ascribe negative characteristics to Democrats is exceeding 80%. The same with the Democrats. They ascribe negative characteristics to Republicans at levels over 80%. It's even getting worse than this. Some researchers have discovered a phenomenon called lethal mass partisanship. What is lethal mass partisanship? It's where a significant number of partisans, people are Republican or Democrat, begin to wish harm on their political opponents. There are surveys indicating still a minority, thankfully, but many millions of Americans would not really particularly care if an awful lot of their political opponents just died. There are many millions of Americans who ascribe subhuman characteristics to their opponents, believing them to be essentially less than human because of their disagreements or because of their actions. And we're beginning to see this. It's not just something you see in tweets. It's not just something you see on Facebook. It's something we're beginning to see in angry in-person encounters around the country. There is no charity. There is no mercy. There is no forgiveness. There's rage and there's anger and there's a huge amount of fear because what happens when you have that level of disagreement or distrust or even disgust for your political opponents. What is the last thing that you want? The last thing that you want is for them to have power. And so the very notion that they would have power can induce panic. It can induce an extreme, um, it can induce a, a, a feeling of deep anxiety, depression even. In 2016, there was an essay written uh, in the run up to the presidential election called the flight 93 election. It became very influential, especially in conservative circles. And the, the argument in the flight 93 election was that people who are right leaning had no choice, but to vote for Donald Trump, no matter what misgivings they had, because in the words of the author, you had to charge the cockpit or America would die, that America would be over. And you're beginning to see this argument in 2020, that if you don't support one side or the other, America will end. Our democracy will be at an end. America will die. And when those stakes are raised verbally again and again and again and again, it creates hatred. It creates rage. It creates fury. It creates panic. It's a phenomenon that's called negative partisanship or negative polarization. It's a very important term. It's one you should think about and learn because you, once you understand what negative partisanship is, you're going to understand American politics and American culture right now. And what negative partisanship means is that there is, you are a Democrat, not because you love democratic policies, not say because you love Joe Biden 
or not because you loved Bernie Sanders or any other leading Democratic figure, but because you really dislike Republicans. You really fear what Republicans will do. And conversely, negative partisanship means that you're not a Republican because you really dislike or that you really like Donald Trump or you really like Mitch McConnell, but because you really dislike Joe Biden or uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or Nancy Pelosi, and that your dislike drives your partisanship, not your likes, but your dislikes. And that's what creates culture wars, including seemingly silly and nonsensical culture wars. Let's take, for example, the culture war that erupted over a mask, wearing a mask. We've seen online, we've seen in real life, all kinds of videos, all kinds of survey data indicating that mask wearing has fallen down and your attitudes on mask wearing have fallen down on a red blue divide. In some way, it makes absolutely no sense, just no sense at all. But my friend Rod Dreher, who writes at the American Conservative, wrote that the mask had become what's called a condensed symbol. In other words, it was a essentially symbolic of a larger issue and it had become symbolic of the intrusion of sort of a progressive technocratic healthcare health elite into our lives. And so the sim, because it was a symbol, there had to be symbolic of the, of a progressive elite. It, there had to be symbolic resistance or actual resistance. And so the mask was divorced from its scientific merits and became a symbol. It became something that we fought about. It still is mind boggling to me in a way that a mask became a culture war in the middle, middle of an epidemic that spread by droplets in the air through respiratory infections, but it did. And we're about to enter into potentially a vaccine culture war, depending on who is seen as really the architect of the vaccine. Is it going to be coming from a potential Biden administration? Does it come from the actual Trump administration? And we're already seeing partisan breakdowns and attitudes towards things like vaccines. It demonstrates that's negative partisanship so that you're for or against something based not on its independent merits, but based upon who's for or against it. If someone you dislike is for it, you're against. If someone you, if you dislike is against, you're for. And this is what negative partisanship is. This is what we've become. So the question is, how do the people of God function in this environment? Do we become part of it? Do we give in to the negative partisanship? Do we give in to the fear? We didn't read this uh, verse before uh, I began speaking, but we know that Christians have an op- do not have the option to give in to fear. We don't. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. We don't have that option. We don't have the option to give in to fear. Do we give in to the hate fest, to the shout fest? Do we get angry? Do we rage at our political opponents? Do we get into the politics of personal destruction? Again, scripture's clear. We don't have that option. Bless those who persecute you. Love your enemies. So we don't have the option to be exactly like the rest of the world. We don't have the option to say, hey, if you knew me in every context other than politics, you'd think I was a nice person. You know, I go on short-term mission trips. I serve the poor in my community. I volunteer at my church. I'm the, you should see how nice I am to my boyfriend or to my girlfriend. Uh, I am an incredibly kind person. Just don't read my tweets about politics. Or don't look at my Instagram story when I'm talking about Trump or when I'm talking about Biden. We don't have the option to divorce that part of our lives from that. We don't have the option to divorce politics from the holistic influence of Christ in our lives. We just don't. So what do we do? What is our goal? How do we become salt and light in a country that is divided by rage and hate? And I would say there's a couple of things that we need to do. One is we need to give up, not just as a body of Christ, but as a nation on the idea that one side or the other, one community or the other is going to dominate and defeat the other side. In fact, the fear of domination, the fear that this other side will take my liberty, will destroy my way of life is driving an enormous amount of our political rage. So, The people of God have to oppose the impulse to dominate. Uh, I selected Micah 4.4 as one of the verses uh, to start this chapel. It's every man shall sit under his own vine and his own fig tree and no one shall make him afraid. Now, if there's any fans of the musical Hamilton who are watching, you remember that 
You remember that those were words that Lin-Manuel Miranda remembered from George Washington. And Lin-Manuel Miranda accurately po- pointed to those words from George Washington, because if you research Washington's writings, more than almost 50 times, he used that verse in his writings, including very famously writing to the Hebrew congregation of Rhode Island, telling the one of the most persecuted religious minorities in the world that didn't know what life was going to be like in this new nation, that you have a place here. What does that mean? Every man shall sit under his own vine and his own fig tree and no one shall make him afraid. In the context that Washington uses it in the context of the, this time, I say it means that we should say to our fellow Americans, even when we disagree, even when we disagree on fundamentally important things, but you have a home here, you have a place here. And that harkens back to the founding of our country. It's sort of fashionable these days to look at the founding of our country and say, well, that's just a bunch of white guys, uh, white Christian guys, mainly not much diversity there. But if you look at the Eastern seaboard of the new United States of America, and you walk down from North down to the South, you will see different theological strains and different religious sects and denominations that comprise essentially the combatants of the wars of religion in the century before these wars in Europe that tore the continent apart and were as destructive and deadly as anything the continent seen until world war one. And so in world war two, and so it, it was hardly inevitable that this nation of incredibly diverse nation of diverse religious beliefs that had been fighting at each other, each other's throats. In fact, many of them were in the United States because they didn't find a place to live in Europe. Christian Europe. They didn't have a place. So they came here. And so that message from Washington resonated. It resonated in a time when religious divisions could tear a nation apart. Every man shall live under his own vine and his own fig tree and no one shall make him afraid. So that's a goal. That's a goal of Christian engagement in this culture is to accommodate, to seek, to defend the rights of others that you would like to exercise yourself to be an instrument of peace and of grace how do you do this? How do you do this? And that gets us to the next verse, Micah 6, 8, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Now we live in a world that often doesn't look at sort of interlocking obligations. The act justly part comes easy to us now. This is what you do when you start a hashtag campaign on Twitter. This is what you do when you're fighting and you're arguing over what the right policy should be over who should or should not be canceled. Acting justly is seeking a just outcome in society. That's what political fighting is arguably designed to do is to try to achieve justice. So that's an absolutely critical obligation of the people of God is to act justly, seek justice, try to bring justice to a society. But that's not the only obligation. There's two others, love mercy, have grace for your political opponents, understand them as human beings created in the image of God, understand that even the wrong have rights. Even when you know you're wrong, even the wrong have rights, defend those rights. And ironically enough in the American system, when you defend the rights of others, you actually create laws and precedents that protect your rights as well. So love mercy. Don't be looking to pounce. Don't be looking to destroy. Seek that, seek the justice, the right outcome, but be merciful to your opponents. And then the last one perhaps is the hardest walk humbly. Y'all, these things are hard. Seeking to ameliorate the effects of 345 years of actual by law racial discrimination defended by violence in the United States of America from slavery to Jim Crow. The results of that are not undone completely in 56 years of contentious change since the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's hard to figure these things out. How do we achieve justice? It is difficult. And so I think that Christians should be walking into the public square, seeking justice. For example, how do we defend life? How do we defend liberty effectively? How do we defend, how do we achieve racial reconciliation in this country? These are not questions that have easy, obvious answers. And if someone's purporting to give you an easy, obvious answer, I would be a little suspicious because I think they might need to read more. So when we understand the complexity of these issues, Humility should flow from that. We should be open. It means we should seek out the best expression of the opposing side's point of view. We should constantly question ourselves. What are my confirmation biases? Are they in play? We should be open to 
communicating with our friends, with our neighbors, with people, strangers online and approach them with a posture of openness. It's the essence of humility is understanding that, or one of the essences of humility, understanding I may not know everything. So that's our goal. Every man shall sit under his own vine, his own fig tree, and no one shall make him afraid. And how do we achieve that goal? By acting justly, by loving mercy, by walking humbly with the Lord, your God. Any other approach I fear just makes us like the rest of the world. It doesn't make us distinctive at all. We're just another interest group, but embracing those two scriptures, we go to a diverse nation with an open heart, with a loving heart, but also a heart that seeks justice. And I think that that's where the people of God fit into this political conflict of our time. Well, one great thing about being able to do this virtually is we get a chance to actually interact with our speaker and we're going to do that right now. So David, you said something that took me by surprise. I actually wrote it down. Mm -hmm. You said Americans disagree with each other. That was, <laughs> I know. That I know. was surprising. No, bit huge if true. Huge uh, truth. But here's what you said that I did write down a term I was not familiar with. And I want to explore a little bit is this lethal mass partisanship. Mm -hmm. And here's what struck me is not only do we disagree with each other, but we wish each other harm and we've attributed subhuman mm -hmm. characteristics. I thought of Martin Buber who talked about three relationships we have with people. I, thou, I, you, and I, it, where mm -hmm. we strip the humanity away from a person and don't even recognize it anymore. You feel we've reached that point today. Well, not all of us. I mean, there's a, a significant minority of Americans have reached that point. Mm -hmm. And Sadly, some of the people who've reached that point, it's almost, they're the, the, among the people who are toughest to reach mm. uh, because uh, if, you d if they disagree with you, they're, they're going to enter into any conversation or interaction with an extreme amount of hostility. So what to do about that when you're there? Yeah. I don't have good answers, but to not get there, I think there are some things that we need to do, some steps that we need to take because that's the end of a process. It's not... People don't start there when they get involved in politics or start paying attention to public issues. And I, I tell you, one of the greatest antidotes towards drifting towards that level mm -hmm. of hatred is actively seek out, and I mentioned this, actively seek out and read the best expression of the opposing side's point of view. Yeah. What you don't want to learn about your opponents from your own team. So, for example, if you are conservative, Every, and you don't want to be learning about what progressives believe from conservative media. Mm. Read mm. what progressives believe from progressives and vice versa. But what we often end up doing is if a big issue comes up, the first thing we'll often do is go to our favorite news site and tell me how I should frame this. Tell me how I, what I should think about this. And look, yes, absolutely. If you're conservative, read good conservative media. If you're progressive, read good progressive media, but make sure that's not all of it. And definitely don't pick out sort of the most extreme people on the other side to get your point of view on what they believe. And I know you're a Harvard graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, we're big fans at the Winsome Conviction Project of the Harvard Negotiation Project. Yes. Love what they do. And what they would say is read it with an attitude of what's right not what's wrong when you do check out a person from the other political party. That's hard to do, yeah. to, uh, to have that kind of openness. And you even get critiqued by your own community for having that kind of openness, right? Oh, all the time. You're called a squish if you're just curious. A I squish. Mean, yeah, squish <laughs> if, if you're just curious or you don't, yeah. you don't have what it takes to fight if you're just curious. But I think that having an open mind and an open heart, it's not the same thing as having sort of being mindless. It's not that, all of your convictions fall out. Right. It's that you recognize your own humility. I mean, your own humanity and recognizing your own mm -hmm. humanity leads to humility. You don't have all the answers. Yeah. You don't have all the answers. And when you say you don't even have all the answers as to who are the best voices to listen to, mm. that's how imperfect we are. And so I, by opening yourself up to opposing points of view that are thoughtfully stated, there's nothing about that that is squish or compromising. I think it's actually an imperative if you are focused on the search for truth and you have to pursue truth sometimes courageously mm. because the truth will sometimes put you at odds even with people close to you but oh, but flesh that out for me because we we are discussing remember janice's idea of groupthink. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're only going to be as open and charitable as your group allows you to be so so maybe we're going to have to challenge our own 
groups to have an attitude change towards people we disagree with. Well, that's, that is really hard. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so there's this concept called the law of group polarization, and it's mm. articulated by Cass Sunstein back in the late 1990s. And it helps explain, I mentioned one, one uh, term, uh, negative partisanship. Yeah. Here's another one, group polarization. Group polarization means that when people of like mind gather, they grow more extreme. Mm. So one of the things that's important and one of the things that, you know, for just to take an example, there's a, a story that after the uh, Israeli defense forces were sh shocked by the Egyptian and Syrian offensive at the Yom Kippur War in 1973, mm. they began to introduce into their meetings a dissenter, somebody who would say, no, I don't think this, their job was to question uh -huh. the conventional wisdom. Yeah. And, but what we, you know, we are clustering with like-minded people now more than ever. We do it geographically, we do it online. And as we cluster with like-minded people, the group becomes, every person in the group will become more extreme. And there's even this phenomenon called a cascade where the group will end up more extreme on an issue than the most extreme person at the start, because you reinforce wow. and you reinforce wow. and you reinforce. So it's an imperative that we have to try it at least in our own mind and our own heart, make sure that that group polarization dynamic isn't happening with all the voices we listening to that we're listening to being the same, coming from the same perspective, or that all of our associations in our lives come from the same perspective. Because the chances are we may not like where we end up or mm. who we become. Oh, that's great. So not only just focusing on the arguments of the other side, but the humanity of the other side. So we did a podcast, uh, the Winston Conviction podcast, mm -hmm. where we flipped a coin mm -hmm. and I got President Trump and my uh, co-host, Dr. Rick Langer, got Vice President Biden. All we did was go back and tell the backstory. Yeah. Uh, this is the history of their convictions. This is um, the families that they grew up in, how it might have affected them. And it didn't necessarily change the way I'm going to vote, mm -hmm. but it changed the humanity of bo both Vice President Biden and President yeah. Trump. That's a good place to start and a biblical place to start, I would right. think. No, I absolutely. And, you know... We often don't get a chance because you know, colleges are different because at colleges, you're often going to have an opportunity to be around a more diverse group of people. Mm. It's going to be an environment where there's fewer people that are not everyone's completely united, even at a Christian college. And so seek out that that's an opportunity to form yeah. relationships. But the other thing is, and again, I'm going to go back to your news diet and your information diet. Mm. There was an interesting mm. study that says from this group called the More in, Com More in Common Project. And here's what they found. Those people who consumed the most political media were the most wrong about their political opponents. In other words, wow. if I consume yeah. a ton of political media, I'm going to assume my political opponents are far more extreme than they really are. Mm -hmm. You're going to rate them as more extremist on guns, on more extremists on immigration, you name it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the less you consume, the more you know about your opponents by these things called personal relationships. And then in the personal relationships, you have a more accurate view, which means doesn't mean you don't have disagreements, it, but at the very least, you're not ascribing to your opponents beliefs that they may not hold. And that's, that's what this extreme online news diet is creating. It's creating, it's manufacturing ignorance, and that ignorance is manufacturing division. I love that. From a communication perspective, uh, I think we need to reclaim perception checking which is I go to you and I say, okay, this is what I've read about you. Mm -hmm. This is what I've read about your position. This is what I've heard uh, that your group believes. I'm gonna check my perception. So am I in the ballpark? Am I wrong? But mm -hmm. David, here's a bit of a problem for Christian communities. We don't have people like that. A Christian community tends to be uh, very limited, closed off. So we're gonna have to take some steps to really make sure that that happens uh, and seek out people like that. Well, yeah, you have to do it intentionally. It's yeah. not easy. And then the other thing is you can't, don't be naive going into it thinking that if I break out of my comfort zone, that it's all going to be kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there are yeah. people on the other side yeah. of you who are not going to be persuadable. They're not. Yeah. They might not even be open. They might not be welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, it's, we, we, we can't have a utopian view. But what we can do is at least begin to try to understand and realize that, you know, a lot of the biblical, com these biblical commands about kindness, mm. about blessing those even who persecute us, about loving those who are even our enemies, mm -hmm. these aren't tactics. Love they're, that. They're Love imperatives. That. Yep. They're imperatives. So 
you love that person and you reach out to that person, even if they don't love you back. And in fact, the fact that they don't love you back doesn't mean that your love hasn't worked yeah. because that's not the point. The point is that it's not the tactic, it's the command. And, and so, you know, we often view our political engagement in a way we view other things things differently. We view our political engagement from a tactical lens, mm -hmm. not a principled lens. Yeah. And I think we have to view it through a principled lens. And, and, and again, that's going to get a lot of pushback. Remember Feinstein just hugged Lindsey Graham? Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Hugged him because she felt like it actually mm -hmm. went well. They disagreed with each other. This was, I think, the uh, Supreme Court confirmation that we're going through and yeah. got severely criticized mm -hmm. for a hug. I think God is saying, I want you to take it well past a hug. Well, we're in a position now where people are so relentless on making sure that everyone agrees with them, that yeah. somebody can agree with you 80% of the time, and rather, and, and, but they disagree 20%. And what we'll often do is say, rather than saying you're my 80% friend, or you say <laughs> you're my 100% enemy because uh, of that 20% okay. of disagreement. And you see this in interpersonal relationships. You see this in politics. Uh, and we'll often look, locate and try to find that point of disagreement, harp on it, focus on it, because we view that as the barrier to true acceptance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to true toleration, when the toleration and the acceptance should be the pre-existing condition. And then the discussion flows from that. Oh, David, I wish we had an hour to continue this conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and saying things that I think, quite frankly, we all need to hear, but particularly confessional schools, mm -hmm. religious schools that we do believe in the truth, but we need to seek out people and get different perspectives with an open attitude. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's continue these conversations. Let's speak the truth, of course, but always do it in love. So let's go out and engage the world in love. Thank you. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.